Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I am an artist working on Gorn. I'm Ruan and I'm a programmer working on Gorn. Gorn is a more physical VR experience than a lot of the other games on the market at the moment. What made us go for that direction and why did it turn out so well? The design goal, at least initially, was just can you make it feel like an object in your hand is weight and make hitting things feel fun? So I think like, because that was basically the entire goal of the game, I think we maybe just tried harder in that aspect. So a lot of our audience has actually asked about the wobbly weapons and some people presume that it's a glitch. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? The simple reason for the, for the wobbly weapons is that some part of the weapon needs to be simulated by physics. If it's not simulated, then it feels like you have this kind of dinky toy super light thing in your hand. But because it's wobbly, it makes it feel like the top of the weapon at least is heavy. So when you move it around, there's a little bit of an illusion of weight. It's really nice if you try and push a weapon into a wall and it has some kind of reaction that makes sense, even if, you know, a bendy rubbery grip isn't necessarily the best thing. At least it's something that kind of makes the f world feel coherent. Yeah. How does designing games for VR totally differ from designing games on other platforms? Or is it not different at all? Well, the coolest difference I'd say between making a VR game and making a non-VR game is that the genres haven't been figured out in VR. Like, because it's a, a whole new platform and a whole new way of playing games, we don't know what the conventions are, we don't know what the good things are. So for instance, if, if you're making Broforce, you're making a platformer and like 90% of that has already been figured out because there's been thousands and thousands of platformer games. So you kind of have an idea of you know, how to create enemies, how jumping should work, what those mechanics are and what are good jumping mechanics, for instance, and what are bad jumping mechanics and platforms is something that you can have like a really strong opinion on. For a VR game, nobody knows any of that shit. So you're basically just figuring stuff out. And even now, I'm sure that there must be entire genres of games that people just haven't thought of yet or haven't made yet for VR just because there are now more possibilities that there weren't before. I think Beat Saber is a really cool example of... Yeah, a, a, it's like an evolution mm. of, of a familiar genre, um, but it is like, it's not something you could have created without VR. Yeah. And I'm really curious to see what those genres are, and I think it's going to be cool to see those develop over the coming years. What VR-specific constraints uh, are there when uh, making the game, and how does that manifest and go on? One of the weird constraints in VR is that in a normal game, like let's say you're playing a first-person shooter, the player doesn't, the player controls an avatar in the game world. So you press a button and some character in the game world moves. And that character or the avatar that the player controls uh, is constrained by the game's rules. Um, you can constrain that avatar in any way you want to. So for instance, the jump height is limited to X. The, the avatar can't pass through walls. When something hits the avatar, they get stunned and fall over, etc. But in a VR game, there's no avatar whatsoever. The player is directly in control of themselves because the player doesn't necessarily have an avatar. You can't constrain the player at all to the rules of the game world. So as far as you can, you have to constrain the world around the player so that they feel like they're an actor in the world. Neither is constrained to the other. If the avatar is not constrained to the world or vice versa, it makes it feel like you're a spectator, like you're not actually in the world. And the same thing goes for if you're making a VR game and the player does not get constrained at all. So in Gorn, we constrain the world around the player. So you can put your hand anywhere and the game always considers it to be a legal move, if you will. Yeah. But the weapon then bends, which is the world constraining to what the player is doing. Even though you shouldn't technically be able to put your hand through the wall there, at least the, the game acknowledges it by constraining the movement of the weapon. And the size of the Gorn Arena as well, I suppose, is a way of giving people kind of like a free space to explore. Yeah, there's a reason why the, the majority of the arena is just open space and it's just walls around the edge. You can't really move a player up and down terrain. Yeah. If there's a small piece of geometry in the middle of it, there's no real way to make the player go over it or, you know, whatever, interact with it in an interesting way. So by keeping the arena simple, you lessen the need for constraint. One of the other things is that you're not playing the game on a monitor, obviously. You're yeah. playing it on a, on a fully stereoscopic view. Player is way closer to things. So how does that affect your approach to creating assets? So one of the very first 
obstacles we faced when designing the Gorn guy in particular. The amount of detail that gets totally compressed, especially on the older uh, VR headsets, was uh, crazy. So we couldn't have high resolution textures. One of the first kind of art direction moves that we made was by making every single shape really chunky. It was trying to keep texture maps to be as non-descriptive as possible. Just to make like figures bigger and more imposing because that made them way more readable in the uh, VR scene. It's actually been interesting to see. I, I've seen a couple of people describe Gorn's graphics as particularly high definition. I think that's because they're particularly low definition. Yeah, and I, I feel like it's ironic because from our perspective, the, the art is, is particularly low definition. I think it's how clear to read everything is. I think uh, after playing quite a few VR games, there's moments where, for instance, you'll be looking down the sights of a gun and all of the iron sights are grey. And at, at the point where you're looking down the gun, you can't really tell the difference between yeah, what's like at the back and what's at the front. Three pixels or something on the... <laughs> and so even if that game has, you know, higher fidelity uh, reflections or the kind of like modern conventions of art that we're used to in AAA games, um, it's harder to read and I think that makes it feel lower fidelity and lower resolution. So in, in Gorn, readability is everything and that comes down to the heads in the crowd, the weapons, the silhouettes of the characters, everything we do is to try and make stuff as readable and easily identifiable as possible. Yeah, I think a, a second component to that as well is, um, again, if you're if you're making a traditional game, a, a platformer ga game, um, you rely on convention for a lot of communication. So typically, you just put a gamepad in a person's hand, and they'll at least know there is a jump button, or th that's like a very realistic expectation. Uh, most people will even probably guess what the jump button is on the first try because of that's the same button yeah. other games use. In VR, we don't have quite those conventions yet, so the player needs to be able to figure out how the game works uh, extremely intuitively. Yeah. Um, and, and just by looking at something, they need to know this button does this thing, or ideally you don't even have a button, and at the same time trying to avoid putting text anywhere in the game except where absolutely necessary. That's been a challenge for the art and design team, to figure out ways of communicating to the player how to play Gorn without writing it out. At least like people understand you know, how to grab stuff. Like That's yeah. the one thing that you don't have to explain in a VR game. And in Gorn, at least, most of it is like pretty simple. So you know, you have an expectation if there's a hammer on the ground, like how to use it. Yeah. We managed to avoid that as well by just having all the objects be very intuitive. Partly because you know, people understand how gladiator weapons work. Yeah, it's easier to, get, to communicate what a sword does. Yeah, and, and partly just by choice. You know, I guess not making the most sophisticated game helps a bit. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, that, that's actually been one of the principally guiding qualities that we've taken throughout the development of Gorn has been keep it simple. So the other thing about VR is that a scene will typically look quite different on a monitor or in a screenshot than it looks through a headset, just because, I mean, it's a different kind of display at a different range. And then also just the feeling of being inside a virtual space is quite different to looking at an image of a virtual space on a monitor. How do you as an artist bridge that gap and make sure that it looks good on both? That's something that we've just been feeling out. And a lot of the chunkiness in Gorn is because um, we want everything to be visible. We don't want any crunching of details. We're making sure that players don't have to lift their heads up to see around the arena as much as possible so that those details are, are visible. And every brick is as big as we can possibly make it so that you're not getting that crunching of details that inevitably happens with the low resolution screens within the headset. So uh, everyone on the Gorn subreddit has been asking, when are we getting multiplayer? The first issue with doing multiplayer in Gorn is that Gorn is not is not a symmetrical game. So I mean, just simply, if you hit a gladiator in Gorn, he goes flying. But you can't do that to a player in VR if they get hit. Uh, and there's other things like you know dismembering enemies and parrying and all those kinds of things that are that are very much not symmetrical between the player and what they're attacking. 
Uh, there's a secondary issue with just the high amount of physics in Goron makes it very challenging to network. It, it's physically possible. I know the Tabs guys do that um, with a bunch of their games. Uh, so it's it's physically possible, but it is very time-consuming, labor-intensive. Adding multiplayer would, at the very least, double the length of development. That's that's the rule of thumb, is it, it pretty much doubles your development time. So the, the team is small. Uh, the team is intentionally small as well. I like that we can do things very quickly, like it's very agile, for lack of a better term. But it comes at the cost that we kind of do need to keep our scope down. But within that scope, we can do whatever we want, like really quickly. So I kind of don't want to grow the team as well to kind of work on non-fun networking for two years. Um, and I don't think I don't think the game needs it. I think we can figure out how to make good VR games first, and then eventually we can figure out how to make good VR, uh, multiplayer VR games. Yeah, I think the focus of the design would be muddied by trying to. Uh, create a multiplayer experience. Yeah, I definitely don't want to double the length of development. At this <laughs> <stage>. <laughs>